Lord bless each of you and ready our hearts for the message from His Word. In just a moment, we're going to um, turn in our Bibles to the letter, second letter of Peter in the New Testament, the third chapter. But it is the first Sunday of the month, and we have um, often dedicated the afternoon gathering to a time for missions reports and uh, giving to uh, missions. At the moment, we're in the middle of a series on the biblical feasts that Reagan from the Angel Church is walking us through. So we're not going to do that this evening. I'm actually not going to to give you like reports and stuff uh, right now, but we are going to pray. And even as we pray and ask God's blessing on the time that we share, we're going to commit those those ministries that we would otherwise have been uh, reporting on this evening uh, to the Lord. We're going to bring them to Him and uh, ask that, Uh, the Lord blesses them in their their ministries. Let's do that just now. Father, we give you thanks for your goodness and grace. We thank you for the opportunity to to gather here today and to to sing songs of worship and praise and, um, yes, instruction to one another. We pray that you would uh, continue to help us to meditate on the wonderful truths that we've, we've just sung and to experience their reality. If there's anyone here today who's, who's wondering why we, we, uh, we can sing so um, loudly, um, enthusiastically, or urgently at times, um, uh, may, may, they, may they enter into the experience of the realities about which we sing. Um, we pray that you would save them by your grace uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, as we approach the ministry from your word, we ask that you would humble us before you, that you would shape and fashion us in the likeness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I ask that you would help me to be clear and bold as I ought to be, and that all of us would be attuned to what you would have us to, um, to, to know and believe from your word. We pray particularly, Lord, this day for brothers and sisters who are gathered elsewhere serving you faithfully. Uh, We thank you for the wonderful opportunity to be part of um, uh, planting churches and revitalizing churches. So we pray, Lord, for um, our supported church in Ukraine, in um, uh, the village of Sushki. We ask that you would be with Vadim and Yana and their family as they serve faithfully through difficult times in a hard place. We ask that even this morning you would um, bless them most especially um, uh, in in ways above all they could ask or think. We pray, Lord, for Adrian and Abigail Yeboah as they are serving you in Amsterdam. We pray that um, as they have uh, continued efforts to revitalize the the, the work um, there, we pray that you would, uh, you would bless that effort. And today, as the church meets, to um, consider uh, a constitution and covenant and various aspects of church infrastructure that um, over the years they've let slide. We pray that that would be a fruitful conversation, one which really um, uh, strengthens and supports not only the um, existence of that church, but its forward mission as they seek to plant churches. We pray, Lord, for uh, our brothers and sisters up the road in Enfield Lock. We thank you for them. We ask, Lord, that your blessing would be upon them, that you would continue to encourage them with uh, people turning from sin to uh, to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, that you would help um, those who who minister there um, and for those who are Um, going out uh, this afternoon even to do evangelism uh, afterwards. We pray that you would would bless the word as it goes out, that it would not return void. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Amen. So we're in 2 Peter today, 2 Peter chapter 3. Locate that in your Bibles. We'll be in verse 14. And you will notice when we read that we're getting in on the middle of a passage of a thought Normally, I don't like to do that, but um, what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks is reiterating some very core aspects of who we are and what we are about as a church. There's no time like the present, and so uh, we will read this text, and hopefully we will 
learn from it in a very positive, informative way for the life of our church. Let's read uh, now 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. And just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. And there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Our vision as a church is um, threefold. We, we, I hope we know our, our mission. It is uh, very much focused on uh, training leaders, planting churches, reaching nations. That's always been at the heart of, of what we do as a church. But um, when it comes to, to how we go about that, three things, they're out there on our banner I mentioned them to someone, um, and they were like, I, d- I didn't know that. I was a bit embarrassed. I felt like I'd failed in some communication. But then I thought, well, it's literally on our sign. So um, uh, read the sign when you go out. Uh, looking in, we are committed to growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking out, our mission is to faithfully preach the gospel to all so that people will trust in Christ and follow Him. Looking up, we come from many places, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in in fulfilling this uh, looking in, looking out, looking up vision, we We devote ourselves to gathering together so that we worship God, we serve one another, and we seek to bless the nations, starting with our own community, with the good news of the kingdom of God. Over the next few weeks, I want to reiterate what it means for us as a church to be looking in, to be looking out, and to be looking up. I hope that especially for members of Grace Baptist Church Wood Green, that this is not new to you. But please, might might I urge you, don't switch off. We need to remind ourselves and we need to refresh ourselves about who we are, what we are, and why we are. In the text before us, we read the words, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We, as we're looking in, as we are uh, seeking to examine ourselves, and as we are seeking to be who we ought to be in Jesus, we really need to look at this verse and commit ourselves to this kind of growth. But to understand the, 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 the verse, we, we, we need to consider a few things. So uh, the soil of our growth. If we wish to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we need to understand the soil of our growth. Because if we're planted in the wrong soil, we're not going to grow. Not properly. You remember a few years ago, we were talking about the, uh, the parable of the, uh, the, the sower, which might as well be the parable of the, the soils. This, this man goes out to sow, and there's different soils that receive the word differently. What soil are we growing in as a church? He says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and, uh, Jesus Christ. We, we cannot 
be planted. Please, please understand this very clearly. We cannot be planted in our works. We cannot be planted in human wisdom. We cannot be planted in any effort that we commit ourselves to or any vision that we subscribe to, or even any mission that we rightfully pursue. We cannot grow roots in the ever-shifting sands of society's expectations. We cannot grow roots in the individual perspectives and preferences that are always changing within ourselves and with those around us. We cannot survive and thrive as followers of Jesus Christ by digging into something other than Christ and the grace of knowing and being known simply by Jesus. Salvation is not of you, it is not of me, it is of the Lord. We just sang it a moment ago that, that we wouldn't let our dear Savior in, but He came like a stranger in the night. And we saw the light because He shone the light in the darkness of our hearts. So what are you trusting in? In what are you finding your assurance? I'm very troubled at times when I sit down and we're having a one-to-one and I ask, I ask how someone's doing and they tell me that they're wrestling with assurance. That might be you this morning. You're wrestling with assurance. That is, you don't know where you stand with God. But you profess faith in Jesus Christ You profess to believe in Him. You profess to trust in Him. But you're saying, I'm struggling with assurance. And then I I probe a bit deeper. Well, I don't pray as I ought to. I don't read my Bible as much as I should. I don't share the Gospel with all the people that I really feel like I need to. Do you see what you're doing? You're not trusting in Jesus when you're rattling off the list of things you feel you should be doing better. You're looking to yourself for confirmation of your right relationship with God. Now I understand that falling short of God's glory will have an impact on how you feel with reference to God. Not being in good fellowship with brothers and sisters will have an impact on how you feel in reference to God. Read 1 John. These things are all connected. Absolutely. They're going to impact you emotionally. But I don't, I, I really don't want when I'm asking someone a, about why they doubt their standing before God for them to list all of the things they do or don't do. Because that is just repeating the old routines of self-righteousness from which we were saved. If you read this text and you are starting with a perspective of what does this tell me about my performance and how I need to work my way up in the Christian life with grace and knowledge seen as somehow bizarrely works Or something you need to do, to start with at least. Well, you're you're reading it wrong. Christianity is not some sort of tier system where um, like Scientology, we pay our way up. Or uh, like um, any number of religious systems around the world where we, uh, we go through the motions and we're always wondering when we stand before God, will we enter into His presence and... Our heart will be weighed in the scales. Will it be heavy? Will it be light? I don't know, but it's... Maybe we'll make it into paradise, inshallah. Well, the reality is grace is not of us. And it's not knowing yourself and what you need to do better. It's knowing Jesus that you must grow in. It, we, we need to examine our soil. Is it the right place or the wrong place? Is it the, the wrong, right soil or the wrong soil? The right soil is Jesus Christ. I, I remember Jesus spoke to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous 
and treated others with contempt. That's called self-righteousness. I can also think of people that I've met pastorally who trusted in themselves that they were unrighteous and treated themselves with contempt. There's a problem. Both of them are trusting in themselves. Our trust must be in Jesus. We've probably all been on the receiving end of self-righteousness. And if we're honest, I think we've, we've all been on the giving end at some point or other. But do you perhaps fall into the other ditch as well? And you think that makes you holier. And sometimes we can fall into this trap of when someone, someone comes and they're, 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 they're burdened by their sin. And we say, well, because you're burdened by your sin, that must mean you're saved. You see, there's a, I want you to think precisely and carefully about this. Because you're burdened by your sin, that must mean you're saved. Um, no, because you're trusting in Christ. That's our soil. And if you're trusting in Christ, you will see the difference between you and your ongoing sinfulness and Jesus and His perfection. But your salvation will only ever come from trusting in Christ. And your assurance can only ever be found in His righteousness because you will always fall short. There will always be something that that casts a cloud of doubt over whether you're all that, because the reality is you're not all that. But Jesus is. Grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let's throw away trusting in ourselves and let's take up trusting in Him. The Gospel calls us not to trust in ourselves one way or the other, but to trust in Jesus Christ. Don't take my word for it. Stick with Scripture. We could go over to Paul's writings. After all, Peter says in the the verses we just read um, uh, that that you should read Paul's writings. Uh, He he says, uh, if you missed it, verse 15, just as our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters. He talks about how some, some twist what he says, the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction what he says And one can think particularly about them twisting what he says about justification by faith into some sort of sinful lifestyle or something. We'll come to that in a moment. But we could go over to Paul's writings and and he says just as they do the other Scriptures, we can go to Paul's writings knowing that they're breathed out by God. That they are Scripture. But let's stay in 2 Peter. It's fine. How has anyone obtained faith? How how did you obtain faith? Chapter 1, verse 1. You can turn there. The answer, you obtained faith by the righteousness of God and of Jesus our Lord. In other words, it wasn't something that you conjured up. It's not something that you worked for. It comes from God. How may we obtain what we need for life and godliness? Chapter 1, verse 3. Look at the answer. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So you did not take it yourself. He gave it. How may we escape sinful desire and corruption and become partakers of the divine nature. Chapter 1, verse 4. And I paraphrase for grammatical clarity. He has granted to us His precious and very great promises so that through those promises we may escape sinful desire and corruption and may become partakers of the divine nature. It all comes back to the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. The ground from which we grow is the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Don't plant yourself in the stuff that you do. Because just as surely, it will be seen what you do not do. And what you've done, but you did it wrong. Plant yourself in the undeserved love, favor, and kindness of Jesus and knowing Him. On Tuesday, I was out on Wood Green High Road and I had a conversation with a couple of lads on the street 
Um, they had just kicked off in a very aggressive way a motorist. The motorist wasn't so nice himself. Uh, and uh, these, these lads were coming from secondary school and um, uh, they were sort of like hammering the side of his white man and he's screaming purple-faced epitaphs and things at them. It wasn't a very nice uh, situation. They cooled down a bit and they walked by our table and the questions and answers board that we had up. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I asked one of them about the state of his relationship with God. His answer, it's good. I, I, I'm really pleased to hear it. How do you know it's good? Please tell me more. Well, I do good things. If that's, if that's your ground for trusting that you have a good relationship with God, then you don't have a good relationship with God. Because your relationship with God is good on the basis of the good things that Jesus did, and you're trusting in Him, not on the basis of the good things that you have done. Okay, I, I kept going. I, I, I said, well, lots of people do good things. Um, there are people who don't believe in God, who, who do I can speak humanly, decent things. But are you right with God? Uh, yeah, I, I, I go to church regularly, he said. I, I'm not going to debate with him how he defines regularly. I'm going to take him at his word. I'm going to assume he's, he's at church every time the door is open. But are you right with God? I, I pray. I'm really glad to hear it. But are you right with God? And we, we, we kept asking questions, and he kept answering stuff that he does. And at no point did he once mention what Jesus has done. And maybe that's you this morning. It's an easy trap to fall into. I can only plead with you. Stop talking about how many times you go to church. Stop talking about how much you pray. Stop talking about how well you're doing with your Bible reading plan. Stop, stop exploring um, you know, all of the various things that you're doing as the basis for your hope. Your hope comes from the promises of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. Your rightness with God cannot be based on the right things you've done or do because they can't erase the wrong things you think, say, and do. Your hope can only be Jesus. I'm right with God because Jesus loved me and gave His life for me to secure my peace by satisfying the demands of eternal justice, turning away God's wrath, defeating the world, the flesh, and the devil that enslaved me to sin, sorting out all my debts and giving me His righteousness so that I stand before God not as not as my judge, but as my Father, ransomed, healed, restored, and forgiven. That's how I know I'm right with God. Not because of me, but because of Him. If you, if you um, would, look at verse 14. Maybe you're stumbling there. Since you're waiting for these, be diligent to be found by Him without spot or blemish and at peace. If you would be without spot or blemish at peace, you cannot start with yourself. You must start with Jesus. You must start by coming to Him, trusting in Him and the truth that He is and all, all that He has done on the cross and in His resurrection for sinful, broken, disordered people who come to Him. In other words, we come to Him saying, I, I'm covered with spots and blemishes. I'm not clean. I'm not pure. I'm not righteous. But Jesus is. He can make me as He is. You'll only be found by Him with a good outcome if you are found in Him. Now this is what is called positional righteousness. By trusting in Jesus, if you trust in Jesus, you stand in right relationship with God. Not because of anything you've done or are doing, 
And if you think I'm being repetitive, I am so that we get the message. It's intentional. It's not you. It's Him who saves. It's not my righteousness. It's His righteousness. It's not my spotlessness and blemishlessness. It is His to start with that He gives to me as I come to Him. Everything that Jesus is, everything that Jesus has done, everything that Jesus continues to do because He lives forever to pray for me, to intercede for me because He knows I need it. Now, that's the soil of our growth. That's not the stopping place. When you're planting something, you don't just start with soil. The soil's there and you just leave the soil and it's just going to grow. No, there, 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 there's going to be growth, substance of your growth. Think about the substance of our growth. Positional righteousness is a glorious aspect of the gospel that we stand in Christ, our sins forgiven. Christ is our hope. But we would miss the thrust of the passage if we left it there. The faith by which we are justified, by which we are declared right with God, produces faithfulness. You can't trust in your faithfulness to get you right with God. You can't look at your faithfulness and say, this is how I know I'm right with God. You can only ever look at Jesus. But that faith in Jesus will produce faithfulness. And others, they'll see it. They'll know it. And it looks like Jesus. Look, look, look at these words in, uh, the, um, in the context of the letter. Growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, What's the context? I, I think it's obvious that the Jesus in whom we rest, by whom we are saved, apart from works, really does want us to work on our personal and congregational holiness. He does. He's not calling us to laziness, to some sort of spiritual softfulness. Because of His righteousness, because of His power that gives us life and godliness, because of His promises that save us, look at chapter 1, verse 5. For this very reason. For what reason? Because of the promises that He's given to us. And the power that He's given to us. Because of who we are in Christ. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And virtue with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. Self-control with steadfastness. And steadfastness with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. He says that if you lack these qualities, then you are spiritually as good as blind and you have forgotten the good news that you were cleansed of your sins. Why, if we say that we've been cleansed of our sins, would we want to continue in our sins? Why, if we have turned from darkness to light, would we continue to seek to walk in darkness? Why, if, if we are saying we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, would we do anything other than respond in gratitude by pursuing urgently and actively lives of holiness so that our lives look like our Savior? Now, there are some who get very uncomfortable when you start talking about the appropriate expectations and standards of Christian living and conduct. I know there are some who get uncomfortable when you talk about salvation by faith alone as well. I know that, that, that there are some who are saying, well, doesn't that mean... Well, we've already answered that. No, it means that you should live righteously. But there are others when you start talking about living righteously. Really, the squirming starts. As a result, I've been told I, I'm not Christ-centered, apparently. I felt like I you know, kind of repeated myself a lot about Jesus just a, a bit ago, and I try and bring everything back to Christ, but you see, it, it's a nice spiritual-sounding deflection, isn't it? Uh, you know, you're not, you're not Christ-centered when you talk about um, holiness. You're talking about us too much. Um, when, we talk about, when we talk about Jesus Christ and the work He's done, that has impact and import for us. 
that's law. I've heard that one. That's law and we are under grace. We're, We're under the new covenant. I know. And because we're under the new covenant... That is, we have a relationship with God in hearts not of stone but of flesh. And that means that He's he's molding us like a potter with clay in the likeness of Jesus, not in the likeness of my sinful self. I, I don't, in all honesty, I don't understand the point if there's not change. If, if, if we say, oh, I believe in Jesus. And we just go on living like we always have, rebelling against Him. Are we really believing in Jesus? Or are we using Him maybe as a get-out-of-hell free card or something like that? The law condemns. The Holy Spirit gives life. And because He's given life, live. Live as you ought. Live as you should. Live as you now can. Live as you are. A new creation in Christ. The soil you're growing from is the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And as you grow up from that soil, you're going to look a lot like the grace and knowledge of Jesus. It's not that grace and what there is to know about Jesus are growing. Because grace is... It's the grace of Jesus. It's as good as it ever will be. And what there is to know about Jesus is not going to change. But our growth is in the experience, enjoyment, and exhibition of these things. I, uh, I saw a, a pastor post something online recently. Um, it, was a, it was a picture, and it said, um, do what you want. And it had that crossed out. And then it, said, it replaced it with, do what glorifies God. And, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's very profound. I don't think it is. If your soil is right, what you want and what glorifies God should be increasingly less opposed. What do I want? Increasingly, my attitude should be, show me what glorifies God and I'll tell you. So, so, so since you, Peter says, since you are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth, Since you are waiting for this place wherein righteousness dwells, pursue spotlessness. Make every effort to be found by Him without spot or blemish at peace. One day we will be without spot or blemish at peace forever. Start start working on that now. Start embracing the experience of that now. This is about how we think, speak, and act as followers of Jesus. How we order our lives. How we lead and love our families. How we shape the the culture in our home and church. How we adjust the temperature around us like a thermostat instead of just telling everyone what the temperature is like a thermometer. Do they see you and you're just communicating what everyone else out there is communicating? Or do they see you and... Do they say, ah, there's something different here. I'm going to draw near. And have have everything turned around. Everything changed. Are you just carrying on with life as normal? Living more or less as you always have? Or is there a difference? What is your trajectory? Is it towards a more obvious reflection of God's goodness in Jesus? More, or more like the chaotic, rebellious, crazy mess that is the world of sin in which we live. What's the substance of your growth? There's one other thing I want you to see in the passage, and that's the, um, the stability of our growth. What is the stability of our growth? Verse 17, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people, and lose your own stability. Growth in the grace and knowledge of Jesus can contrast completely with the beliefs and behavior he addresses in 2 Peter chapter 2. Maybe in your Bible you have a heading. It says false prophets and teachers. 
Have a look over that. His focus is specifically on people who secretly bring in destructive false teachings that factually or functionally deny Jesus as master. They lead people astray, he says, with sensuality. Others blaspheme the truth because of them. They're they're characterized by greed and exploitative behavior. They live in self-indulgence. And instead of being alarmed by the sensual conduct of an increasingly wicked world, they embrace it. They mirror it. They mimic it. They reject the authority of God who is fully in Jesus and those who stand with Him for righteousness. Peter's emphasis seems to be on an approach to the gospel that scoffs at righteousness and those who preach it. A way of thinking that cannot be reasoned with, but stubbornly speaks errant nonsense with confidence. They are about sex, power, and money. Verse 14 of chapter 2. I didn't make that up. Read it. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. Grace meets the scoffing of the world with a better demeanor. And knowledge answers its objections with a greater declaration. One filled with warning and promise. Painful honesty about us and our sinful condition, but also certain hope of a Savior who will bring everyone who trusts in Him into a new heaven and new earth in which righteousness dwells. But when you're growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, you don't scoff at God in His ways. You don't adapt your message to suit the tastes of the cultural moment. But you keep serving up the timeless meal of God's law and gospel as it's meant to be. God is good and great and He made a good world. People rebelled against Him and fell from a stable, right relationship with God. And so they faced the consequences, His wrath and His justice. Jesus lived the perfect life so that He could die a sacrificial death and rise victoriously from the grave so that we could be restored to God if we turn from sin to believe in Him. He he gives us not only the promise of eternal life in the future, but even its power now to think, speak, and act differently from a helpless and hopeless world. A world that's given over to self-indulgence, that's tearing itself apart, and sometimes seems like it's ever on the verge of collapse. But the Gospel of Jesus brings stability. It says that in the text. You know in advance that people are going to mess about, even with Scripture. The ignorant and unstable will twist things to their own destruction. You know it beforehand. Take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Our stability is found in the soil, which produces the substance. And so we keep going back to Jesus as He is. Not as we want Him to be in our image or whatever, but as He is. People rebelled against Him. People can be reconciled to Him by trusting in Jesus. So planted in the soil of Jesus, growing in the substance of Jesus, we can withstand the winds that blow this way and that, trying to bend us to the various conflicting spirits of the age. In Jesus, we're at peace. In seeking to live like Jesus, when others are given to self-righteous faith and self-destructive practice, we are at peace. We wait for His return. We pray for His return. We hope for all things to be made new. But we must realize that while His return is salvation for His people, it is certain destruction for the world and wrathful justice for untold many more who would enter hell far from right relationship with God. Jesus Himself repeatedly said it. And this is not unkind, nor is it unfair of God. He's repeatedly warned us about it so that we don't have to to face that. 
but simply the consequences. And I know that's a concept that is foreign to many, but consequences are real. He waits. And for us, we can look and we can see Him waiting to return as an opportunity for more to be saved as they come to know Him. And it's an opportunity for us to grow in the joy of His salvation. Last week, um, I told you a story of um, part of our church's history. And uh, I called you to see from the parable of the great banquet that there is still room. There's still room at the Feast of Jesus Christ. This week, I want, I want you to see not our past, um, but our present. Where we are, where we're going, and how we're going to get there. And the answer is simple. It's the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's it. We can't boast. We can't be proud. We humble ourselves before the grace and knowledge of Jesus and we give Him praise that He works in us and through us as He wills. If I may, however, reference a little portion of our history. We, we described ourselves not as looking in, looking out, and looking up. We, we described ourselves as um, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, actually. That was on the sign outside, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because we have to grow. We have a long way to go. There's much growth within us that's needed. We do not pretend that we are something when in so many ways we're nothing apart from Jesus. We, we don't want to uh, put up a facade of we're better, we're greater. I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm, I'm really sick of seeing that approach taken to... Um, ministry, mission, church planting, and so forth. It's always like we're trying to one-up one up some other people down the road. We're better than them. We're not like the crummy old church of your grandparents. Just always seemed a bit disrespectful as well. But um, if you had Christian grandparents, you'd give God praise. But uh, we're growing. We don't have it all together, friends. And maybe we know that so intensely that we kind of can be paralyzed, um, but we don't have to be. Growing in not yourself and your own whatever self-development, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Keep going back to Jesus and keep taking more of Jesus to those around you. I hope we've not moved on from the spirit of this, this passage, growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Christ Church is a community of conviction and kindness, and those two are never enemies, where we know that the love of God for us is real and active in our midst, and we show that love in what we say and do to others. Let, uh, we, as we, we look at this, um, this verse, grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, can we make that our prayer this morning? That, Lord, Lord, would you, having planted us, water us, and bring increase, bring growth, help us to know and experience more of your grace. Help us to know you more. That is our prayer. Because as we know more of his grace and more of him, well, then we're thinking less of ourselves. Thinking more of him and caring more for those around us as we ought. How do we do this? Well, when, we're, when it comes to looking in, how will we grow? There are lots of ways that we, we impact each other, but it never, it never gets bigger than the Word of God. Everything that we do, everything that we say, has to be shaped by the Word of God. That's why we say looking in. And you might be thinking, okay, we're looking into ourselves. Great. We look into God's Word. That's how we're going to grow. Everything we do. The Word of God, I hope we can say, is central 
at Grace Baptist Church Wood Green. And as we're devoted to the pursuit of greater conformity to its unchanging truth as opposed to the decaying culture around us, we, um, we, may, we may feel tested at times, but we anchor ourselves to the Word of God. There's no ministry that we are involved in. Test and see. There's no ministry that we're involved in as a local church that is not shaped or touched in some way by God's Word. At the beginning and end of the Lord's Day, every week, except for that last Sunday of the month when we have lunch instead, um, we, uh, we, open, we open God's Word. Every week we do that, at least once. And we seek to explain, illustrate, and apply it for the blessing and benefit of those gathered. Why? Because we must grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it's here. Our Tuesday grace groups. We've used various study guides but always to help us ask the right questions of God's Word and discuss the proper applications. On Wednesdays, when the youth get together every two weeks after school, it's not just for a jolly. There's food and there's fun, I think. You'll have to confirm with with them. Um, It's pretty simple. We don't have a lot that we can do other than Have some good food, play some silly games, and then sit down and discuss God's Word. That's it. It's not fancy, but it's foundational. On Thursdays when we have prayer meetings, we offer prayers for each other. We share news from churches and updates about our own church, and we pray about them, yes, but we also take a passage of Scripture and to shape our prayers according to the will of God, we pray through that passage in pursuit of the glory of God in our lives and in the church. We we can't have this thing over here has the Word and this thing over here doesn't. Together we, and particularly me as your pastor, we labor to pour God's Word liberally into people's lives. I don't do this for you to feel convicted, but remain unchanged. I don't do this for you to be changed, but then to go and self-righteously try to coerce um, uh, an external standard onto others that hasn't been birthed in them by the power of the Holy Spirit. I do this simply to honor God in giving you a good diet of spiritual food that will help you grow healthily and safely in relationship with Him. If we submit to the Word of God, if we pursue all of it that we can and think clearly about its implications and applications for how we live life, it will have an impact on our beliefs and our behavior. It will give us precision and discernment for error and it will shape our spiritual taste buds for truth, so that we know what's bad when we taste it, and we know what's good, and we crave what's good. His Word will guide us, so we know when and where to rest, and when and where to serve in the many practical areas where we desperately need to work together. I once, I once uh, was asked to read a book by a... Um, evangelical American guy who had converted to Roman Catholicism. And uh, I I kept coming across this man's name, sometimes doing work in the Irish traveling community. Johnny will know, um, you know, uh, uh, I think your aunt was like talking about this guy all the time um, and uh, watching his YouTube videos and stuff. And so I kept hearing his name. And I I don't know, some people, they can sit through a two-hour YouTube video about something. I, I don't... I'm not that guy. I I can't sit through a five-minute one often. It's just, you can't have it on in the background, really, um, on your your phone anymore. So I just, you know, if if I can read and there with the person, discuss it with them, I'll do it. He gave me a book by this guy, and um, I found it very interesting. It was kind of a a memoir and an explanation for why he, um, he made that conversion. Here's what was troubling. There was a lot that I agreed with him. That's not what was troubling. Um, what was troubling is that the reason he made that jump is he went to a Catholic church and they read more Scripture than the evangelical church that he was so attached to. I found that disturbing. Because one of the core...